So I wanted to say thank you for taking the time to attend. I, I think it's healthy for us to do these, even though this is a relatively small sample size of our church family, from time to time to have church family meetings where we can talk about what's going on and have you have a chance at, to ask questions. And there, you should know there are a number of people who will watch this online as they did last time as well. So I want to take a minute just to say to all, all of our staff members who are attending, and this, it's not required that they do, but would you stand if you're a staff member so we can just say, recognize you and thank you? Yes, thank you. Awesome. Way up there. Thank you, all of you, very much. And to our, any executive council members here, board members who are here as well, would you stand also? Kim's here, Chris, Tracy, good, thank you very much. We're grateful for you, uh, for your service as well. So uh, in keeping with what we did last time, I'd like to uh, bring uh, our Director of Operations, Abe Doncell, up to give us just a brief little glimpse into how we're doing financially. Not a whole lot has changed there, but I thought it'd be good for us just to uh, give an, an update and then for have you a chance to ask questions about that before we move on to some more strategic visionary things. Abe. Great. Thank you, Jeff. And uh, good afternoon. I think it's officially afternoon. Yes, 1217. So um, if we can, I just want to take, as Jeff mentioned, a quick opportunity. For those of you here last time, I had the, the chance to share a little bit of our kind of financial health and, and, and where we're at uh, from, uh, from the standpoint of, of our generosity and giving. So I wanted to provide a quick update. Again, only a month has passed and it's when it's good news, I want to make sure we take ample opportunity to share that. So uh, if we can go ahead and put the slide up. This are our financial highlights. This is uh, data that I share routinely uh, with the EC as well as with our staff. Um, this is for just the first two weeks, excuse me, first two months of our fiscal year ending October 31st. So we're a couple weeks uh, even past this time and, and it's continuing continues to be good news, but officially through our first two months, we see that we're operating just about $90,000 or so ahead of our uh, budget. And uh, for those of you who may recall and, and are been around, our budget this year was uh, voted by the congregation to be uh, not an insignificant increase over our previous budget. So we're running a budget of approximately $5 million. And so to be uh, ahead of that to this extent, uh, at least the first two months into the year is I think uh, an indication and just a true representation of the generosity and, and the faithfulness of, of this body. So it's, it's great to see that. Uh, Equally good news to a degree is we're also running behind a little bit on our expenses. So we're about 48,000 behind our expenses. That's driven by a couple of things. I think to one degree, the, the stewardship of the staff that uh, you've seen represented here and those that are even not here to work uh, just tirelessly and very carefully to make sure that we, any investment we make, any expense that we incur is truly needed and, and aligning with, with our overall vision and mission. But also we have a couple of key staff positions that are currently vacant that we're actively recruiting for. And so that's also uh, put us a little bit behind in our expenses as, as those are roles that we anxiously are looking forward to filling, but in the interim um, are not obviously paying for those salaries yet at this point. So uh, a little bit of a, of a uh, kind of a win-win there as it relates to our budget. Uh, net net, we are running at about $550,000 in our unrestricted funds, which gives us about a month and a half. We're actually a little bit even ahead of that. So we're closing in on just two months of operating expenses kind of in reserve. And so it's something we work closely with the finance committee and with our staff to understand how to have that strong position of stewardship. Again, in case we is an unexpected need or something that we can respond to, that we're, we're being faithful to that, but that we're also using those funds wisely to support uh, the ministries as well. And then as you see our worship attendance, um, that's also being driven by a, a continued increase. And as I said, I think last time, uh, it's, in, it's an increasing number on an increasing number. So as our uh, uh, attendance and congregation continues to, continues to grow, we see even an increase over that number as time goes on. And so both in the last two months and over the last 12 months, we've seen a pretty strong increase in, in attendance overall. And if you can click once, I just want to show you, um, there's another, I think, build on the slide here, maybe hard to read, but just to give a little more indication on kind of what that looks like from our average giving, um, you see on the, on the bars to your left, that's our 1819 kind of fiscal year, and on the bars to the right, it's your, our 1920 fiscal year, and, and I apologize, the, the font might be hard to read, but you see on the bottom under 1819, we had roughly 300, or not roughly, we had 360 giving units, so that's families or individuals, but giving units in that time period of this same, this same time last year for our 18-19 fiscal year, and we had about 360 giving units that you can see the, the uh, average gift uh, is the darker bar on the left, and the median gift is the yellowish bar on the right. And if you look at this same period this year, so for our 1920, we've increased that to 381 giving units. So we've got more people coming alongside and, and demonstrating generosity and, and a desire to be part of the body here financially. 
And what's interesting is not only is the number of people giving, but the average gift is also increasing. You see there as the, that bluish bar on the right, uh, significantly higher than the bluish bar on the left. So just a great indication of what God is doing in the hearts of, of his people here and their commitment to not only attending and being part of, but, but generously supporting the ministry here and the opportunity to reach lives and impact our community. So just wanted to share that briefly. Um, you see a little highlight at the bottom. The, the net net story of all this is that our giving is up roughly 33% percent over this same time last year as, a, as your congregation. So just a great indication of all that God is doing here. So that's all I wanted to share specifically today. I don't know if you want to take questions now. We're running that, Jeff, or we want to? Anybody, sorry. Anybody have any questions related to the finances of the church, both what's on the screen or things that maybe not? Sure. Well, we have more, more than two. We have two that have been open uh, for, for a while. Um, so that it's constantly changing. Obviously, people coming out. We've got a, a facilities management position or, or someone uh, supporting our, our facilities manager that's been open for uh, quite a while that we've been trying to, to fill. And that's been a key role. Uh, we also have a couple positions in our communications department, both for a graphic artist as well as for someone to support our social, social media activities. And then on the ministry side, we actually have a couple openings um, in our um, Masterpiece Kids uh, John, do you, do you want to speak there to as well. So we'll let John speak to that. There we go. Sorry. We have uh, several positions open on the ministry side. We do have two positions in our Masterpiece Special Needs Ministries. We also have a position open in our, our Chapel Street Kids um, ministry. And then we also have a, a position that we are in the process of developing uh, for our trips, um, for our, our overseas trips, uh, director for that role as well. So those are the current roles we have in the ministry side. They are all, at the moment, part-time positions, yes. but very significant ones. Mm -hmm. So thanks for asking that question. Yeah. Todd. Uh, you mentioned giving up 33% of the past year. Yeah. So what's the correlation with attendance in the past year? 3% uh, 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 is what the slide just showed a minute ago. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, the, the giving, 33% is year to date, our fiscal year, which is two months. So because our fiscal year, so our giving for September and October is up 33%. Our, yeah. For that same time period, our attendance is up 3.2%. Now, one of the interesting things about attendance, that, that is, so we're working on what we call a dashboard of engagement. That sounds like a funny phrase, but it means a, a look at different ways to measure. Typically, churches have measured uh, growth in just two ways. You know, dollars in coffers and people in pews, right? You know, they just attendance and giving. And those are still valid, but that's not the only way. Because uh, across the nation, and we're no exception, people that call it, uh, this their church, uh, their church home attend three Sundays out of eight on average. All of you being present this meeting might be the exception to that rule, but that's true about our church. Those who call Chapel Street their home are here less than twice a month on average. Kids, have, kids sports or activities, family things going on, travel, whatever the reasons are. Uh, and some of that is not good. We want to we want to paddle against the current of our culture and call people to be in corporate worship weekly. Some of it also is just the way the world is, and we you know we're, we're just I'm not making a value statement. I'm just saying that's true. So even to see any increase in attendance actually is is saying more than that number says because that's who's showing up weekly. We know, but what that means is what the number of weekly attendance is. That's that's about half or less of our worshiping body of our congregation, whoever shows up on a given weekend. Um, now, it's the same half. It's not the same exact number of people rotating, but so it's an interesting, because we were seeing flat or declining attendance five years ago and increasing giving. Now we're seeing an increase in both, which is a really healthy sign. And again, there's, we're tracking other ways of engagement in terms of participation in small groups, engagement in serving, the number of people serving and new servants. So there's a lot more ways to track and, and measure engagement in the life of Christ than just showing up on the weekend. Anyway. Other questions about that before we move? Yeah, Clark. What is the finance committee that you refer to? What is this committee you refer to? <laughs> it, uh, well, it is, it's uh, a body that was created, and to be honest, I haven't met with them yet for the first time. Our first meeting is in a couple weeks uh, in my tenure, just coming out October 1st. But it's a committee of, I believe, five attendees uh, or five participants. There's a couple of our EC members that are on that and, and a couple non-EC members. And, and it's just an advisory committee um, that helps support the, the advise the EC as well as uh, myself and my role as director of operations around our financial health well-being we'll be sharing we just completed uh, which is probably interesting to share we just completed our annual audit 
uh, with an external audit committee, and so we're, we're waiting the final results of that. The, the good news is they gave us a very strong thumbs up uh, immediately concluding the audit, but we're waiting for our official audit report. We'll be reviewing that with the finance committee, but that, that's who that is. It's, a, it's just a, a third, yeah, it's, it's a body I, I that's here. it's actually in our bylaws as well to have a finance committee. Yeah, correct. Our, so it's an advisory committee, but it meets with, Abe's the only staff member there. Anybody here ever served on it? Yes, Kim, Kim, can you speak, Kim, can you, anything you want to add to that? Thanks for the question, thank you. Other questions about finances before we move on? The good questions to ask. As a professor of mine once said, there are no dumb questions, just dumb people who ask them. <laughs> <laughs> That's terrible to say, but he said, I didn't say it, he said it. <laughs> Yes, sir, go ahead. <laughs> Yeah. Serving and you and Brian. But, you know, when somebody says, how many pastors do you have? I really don't know. I know we got more than three. Yeah. But, uh, and four. Good. I'd like to have a list or something. Maybe they're in the, uh, the um, what, internet. Yeah, they're, they're in the internet. They're in the ether. <laughs> yes. Uh, yeah. uh, yes. Yes. Our, all of our staff and their titles and roles are on our website, but I can speak to that right now because it's a good question. Bill was asking about our pastoral staff and ministry staff in general. And so uh, Andrew Griffiths, would you stand up? And Joe Scavato, would you stand up? So Joe is a pastoral resident. He preached here for the first time a few weeks ago and has preached a few times. He's in a two-year residency program where we're, he's being developed for pastoral work. Andrew preached today on the new self, the new identity. I see you put your new coat on. That's good. So, you know, Andrew, and Andrew is oversees our middle school ministries, pastor middle school students, but also on our preaching team. Joe uh, is in, in the residency right now, but we're preparing him for more specific. So we have, um, okay, let me, let me finish the first question. Laura Terrell, would you stand up? Who's over here on the, on the side? Anybody else on our staff on this side of the room or in the center back? Uh, John, of course, John Bechtel. So, and Kenton's up top. Sorry, Kenton's waving. So Kenton is pastor of worship ministries. Laura doesn't hold the title of pastor, but she oversees all of our group, small groups and really is a pastoral presence to our word and table service just down the hall here. John is our executive pastor. He oversees all of the ministry side of ministry. We talked about this last week, but in case you missed that, or last meeting. Um, if you think about the operation of the church in two halves, operational side, communications, finance, information technology, facilities, all of that that makes the engine go, that's Abe. Stand over here, Abe. Right? Here's John. If you think about women's and children and students and worship and um, missions and small groups and all the ministry side, that's John. These two guys lead those two halves under my direction. So that's their roles, respectively. Kenton is the pastor of worship ministries. He oversees every worship leader and worship staff member across all three venues, uh, helping to develop them. Kenton Cobra, he's right behind you. Wave, Kenton. Hi. Pastor Kenton. Yes. Uh, yeah. yeah. So good, 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 good. But this is, Bill brings up a good point. We've been doing something on social media. I don't know if you've seen this, if you're on social media. Some of you may not be. We've been posting on Facebook uh, about once every couple of weeks, highlighting a staff member. Uh, I didn't mention Bruce. Some, he mentioned you, but you're here. Because Bill already knew you. That's why I didn't say your name. Bruce, by the way, if you don't know, Pastor Bruce oversees all of our local and global uh, outreach and impact. So this, whenever we talk about Serve the World Partners, that's, by the way, over half a million dollars given away a year. Bruce oversees, he's not in charge of all the money by himself. He has a committee, but he, but he, he oversees all of that and does a fantastic job doing it. So. And Paige uh, Peltier, Paige is not on pastoral staff, but she is in charge of a, a number of things. Our summer internship, pastoral residency under Brian's direction, connections, new connections, and, and uh, helping people assimilate into the life of the body. Where's Carrie? Carrie Van Rossum over here also works with Paige in connections and assimilation. And so I could go on and on and talk myself into a cul-de-sac I can't get out of with our staff. But on social media, we've been trying to highlight a staff member once every couple of weeks. You might have seen Peter. Is Peter Peter's probably not here today. But Peter Hansen, he is here. 
He's in the video room. Peter Hansen is the, uh, our videographer. How many of you have been blessed by or encouraged by some of the video stories we've done over the years? Yeah. Amazing. Let, let me tell you about Peter. His wife, Heather, is right here. She's beaming with pride right now. So Peter came to us as a, as a, a summer intern in our, in our uh, we call Leadership Institute internship program. Pastor Brian is over that, but Paige directs it. It was previously directed by Ali Goble, who's now the worship leader at Mill Creek. It's grown in its size and complexity and scope and, I think, strength over the years. Peter was one of our first, I think, interns there and did a second internship, and then we hired him. And we have been so richly blessed as he's grown in his gifts and his expression of them. It's been incredible for our church. He's a great storyteller and an artist and so insightful and so good at what he does. And he and his wife are praying about going on the mission field, which would be great. I know it would be great if they go. But <laughs> it will be, we, we will miss them terribly when they do. But anyway, that's, so there's a number of people that serve in all kinds of roles, which you don't always see behind the scenes. Eric Robertson is standing back there. You can see the top of his head and his crazy mustache. By the way, if you don't like his mustache, would you tell him on the way out? You think it's time for, for it to go. No. <laughs> he has named his mustache. But anyway, Eric is our director of all technical production. So he oversees both what happens midweek and weekend, all the things that make it seamless and excellent that you don't even notice unless something goes wrong. He handles all of it. And, and so he has a whole team of volunteers, soundboard, video, lighting. Uh, that's Eric. And it all falls under him. And we are growing. And Eric was probably rolling his eyes right now. We're growing a, at a... Uh, exponential rate in terms of what we're trying to do on the technology and production side, and, and Eric is uniquely skilled and capable of, of handling all of that. So, okay, enough about our staff. But we're trying to highlight different staff members and tell you who they are and what they do, because to your point, Bill, you kind of know the guys who stand up here each week, but you don't know all the other people that are doing really remarkable ministry. That's a good question. Any other questions? Oh, you asked about residency. What is that? I, I just forgot about it. How about Paige talk about it? Paige, come on. Come on down. Paige, tell to everybody. Yay. Yeah, so our pastoral residency falls under Pastor Brian and myself, and our heart is really to raise up young leaders in pastoral ministry. So there, it can be as complicated as you want it to be, but it's a two-year program to bring in young leaders and to equip them with practical hands-on experience. So right away, Joe had a lot of giftings early on to be able to jump in there, so you guys are already familiar with him, but um, he works really closely with Pastor Brian and goes over all his sermons and everything into great detail. Um, and then he's going to continue into his second year of residency and continue to be equipped in things like visiting people in hospitals and funerals and weddings and all of those things where it's like in a seminary class, maybe you talk about a wedding for a day, but to actually follow our pastors around and learn in a hands-on experience. So, so us around. Yeah, that's that. <laughs> yeah. So uh, the, I, I, a number of years ago, I was watching the NFL Network channel uh, with my NFL channel, whatever it was, with my son Noah. And they had a show on uh, about the great coaching trees of the NFL. It was a, you know, a show about like how all these coaches we know about today got their start from a few guys, Vince Lombardi, George Hallis, and a few of these seminal coaches. And it had this infographic with these branches spreading out, and it showed all the coaches you know, that we all know about and how they could trace their lineage back to a, a coach who believed in them and gave them an opportunity. And I remember late that night thinking, the church should be like that. We should be a place that has branches spreading out where people were believed in and had opportunities and got their start in, uh, here. Not just here, but other churches as well. That's kind of the vision behind the pastoral residency and the summer internship, to invest in kingdom workers. Now, selfishly, we hope to pick the best of them to stay here and serve with us as we continue to grow. So if the church continues to grow and we have more needs and opportunities, then we'll be hiring some of these people. But even... If not, launching them into kingdom ministry in other places. Uh, it's very exciting to see that already happening. Um, Peter's only one example, but already happening. And so, anyway, that's a, a great question. I'm glad you asked it to talk about it. Uh, anything else before we move on now? Okay. Uh, keep your questions. We'll have time at the end. So, I want to, I mentioned this at the, in the service today, but this, we're heading into now middle of November and on in December, the season of consumption in our culture, right? 
where people are thinking about buying, eating, shopping, you know, and all that stuff. And we as a church want to be focused on a, a season of, of service and prayer. So to that end, I, I know this is repeating what you heard today, but I want to reiterate it. Uh, it's, when we talk about service around here and create opportunities like Big Family Serve Night, which happened last weekend, which was fantastic. If you don't know what that is, that's like, uh, how many of you went to Parents' Night when your kids were in school? How many of you didn't like Parents' Night? Not everybody. Nobody likes Parents' Night. Parents don't like Parents' Night. Kids don't like Parents' Night. Teachers don't like Parents' Night. It's, uh, it's, but everyone loves Big Family Serve Night. It's a replacement for that. You come there, and instead of walking around and kind of just being bored with what they're telling you, you serve as a family. You go shopping, share why you're shopping for, and fill our food pantry and serve as a family. We had close to 400 families, well, people, uh, I don't know the exact number of families, coming and shopping and packing on Wednesday night. And so um, service is, is not just a card we hand out or an opportunity, a call out or a one-time thing. Uh, it's, a, it's meant to be the part of who we are as God's people. And so that's why we give the serve in the season card for people to integrate service into their life, especially this time of year. And... This next one, a service of, of worship and prayer. It was in this room, um, I think I might have shared this at the last meeting, I can't remember now, three, four years ago, three and a half years ago, Pray Fox Valley, three years ago, three years, it was a number of years ago. In this room, Pray Fox Valley, we, we hosted, and at that prayer event, I felt God tapping me on the shoulder to start a, a prayer, start praying with pastors in the, in the Tri-Cities. We've been doing that now for three years together. First Thursday of every month, we meet and pray. Um, and just this past Thursday, we were right here in this room uh, praying again. Uh, John was there, and we have lunch together, we, and we meet in different churches and pray. And we haven't had another... I remember being at that event and, and seeing our people and others gathered together, clustering up and praying together. And I just thought, this is... You know, a healthy church is not just a church that, where the finances are up and where the attendance is up, but it's a praying church. Bill, I remember be playing golf with you. You might not remember this. And you were beating me with one hand, by the way. But, um, and you asked me, we were on, I don't know what, what hole it was. Is it Potawatomi? And, you, and I, was, I was, this is years and years, this is a decade ago or more. And you said, I don't, I'm not going to ask you how much time you spend preparing your sermon, Jeff, because I could tell you do that. But I'm going to ask you how much time you spend praying about your sermon. Do you remember asking me that? And then you, and then you kind of laughed and said, I'm not going to make you answer. <laughs> But it convicted me. It convicted me, and you were right. A healthy church is a praying church, a church that comes together and prays together. Now, you don't need an event to do that. We have lots of people praying all the time in different contexts. But that's what this is for, to bring our church family together across campuses, at least a representation of it, to lift our hearts in worship and gratitude and to pray, uh, thanking God for all that he's given us. So we encourage you to attend and invite other church family members to attend as well. That's what that will be. Okay, next slide. Uh, I want to reiterate our neighborhood church vision. After our last meeting, uh, an individual who, uh, a couple of them actually, who watched it online, uh, approached me and, and with concern uh, because we talked about a fourth campus. They said, hey, why, why are we thinking about expanding? Isn't that what got some of these churches that have blown up into trouble because they're always thinking about more and more and more? Isn't, isn't that a bad thing? Shouldn't we just focus on what we have here? And I want to address that for a minute. Let me put the vision statement up there if you would, please. We are a family of neighborhood churches. We are already, three. Um, each one a place to experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact right where we are. If that's true of us, and I believe that is increasingly true, what is the natural outcome of that? Of a place where people can experience grace, grow in faith, and make an impact? What happens? It grows. Paul says in Philippians chapter 1, the gospel has been growing and bearing fruit since the day you first heard about it, in you and in the world. It is the nature of the gospel to grow. It's the nature of the church to grow. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Do you ever think about that in Matthew 16? Or 18? No, 16. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Who has the gates in that analogy? The gates of Hell. We think of heaven as the gated community, the pearly gates, you know. And we import that into our thinking about life here. The church is somehow, we have the gates. Close our gates, keep all the bad out, keep all the good in, and hang on till heaven. That is not the biblical vision. The biblical vision is the kingdom of God is advancing. The church should be kicking down gates, you know, uh, taking territory for the king. 
That happens in justice work, compassion work, and gospel work. And the, and the, and the product of that is expansion, growth. So when we talk about fourth campus, I hope you hear my heart and our heart. It is not like we want to build our big thing. We want to, we're not in a hurry. We don't want to run ahead of God. Neither do we want to lag behind. We also want to recognize that this gospel growth happens because you pursue it. You pray about it, you plan for it, and you pursue it. And so that's, in case, you, in case that's a question in your mind or you get asked that, that's why we talk about a fourth campus. Because it's part of our vision. We've said it from the beginning. We thought God brought us Mill Creek to aim us in a direction of where he wants us to go, which is multiplication and reproduction for the sake of the gospel impact. Now, when that happens and how that happens, we said last meeting, we don't know right now. We're trying to prepare so when God brings us the opportunity and the, op- and the place, we'll be ready to join him. But we're not trying to force. So any questions about that? I want to be, I got asked a couple questions in the wake of the meeting, and they're good questions. They're good questions to raise. Some watch, yes, please, Clark. Right. Those comments were made by you and John. I thought were really insightful. Thanks for, the, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you, you're quite right. So you think about, so you think about the, what, what would it take to launch a fourth campus? Four parallel tracks. Uh, you, you, you have the financial track, debt reduction, continued growth, preparation, creating margin so that we could purchase a facility, renovate a facility, or rent a facility, whatever ends up, God ends up having for us. We need to have, we need to be financially strong enough to do that. So, and then the second track would be leadership development track, and that would be what you're just talking about. Staffing, who's going to lead in that, that campus, not just the person, the, the pastor, but also the worship team, the worship leader, children's ministries leaders, group life, there's a number of things there. And then on the other side of leadership development would be the leadership development of the core. One of the things that made Mill Creek successful was that we launched not just a, a group of spectators, but participants. Part of going to Mill Creek meant I'm signing up to serve. I'm part of making this mission successful. So leadership and staff, leadership and, and the launch team. And the fourth track is the place. It's one of the hardest things to find is the right place. Um, and so we want to be developing on all four simultaneously and they may not all be aligned yet, and that means we're not ready. But that's a good, that's a good, thanks for pointing that out. Any other, yes, yes, sir, Jim. Do you have a target area? So, like, yeah. where you are in the journey? Is it like the South Valley, or could it be anywhere? Or are you trying to stay? That's good. Thank, thanks, Jim, for asking that. So, um, some of you might remember back to our neighborhood impact campaign. We had that cool video, which, by the way, Peter did. Um, and, and, it, and it showed our neighborhood as a, as a church family. So we think you have a neighborhood. God's sovereignty applies to your home address. Think of your address. You're there not just because you chose it, but because God placed you there. We are placed where we are in the Tri-Cities area, King County region. So we think of our neighborhood this way. Route 20 in the north. Route 30 in the south. Route 59 in the east. And Route 47 in the west. Rough rectangle. There's over 650,000 people living in that rectangle. And data we have from 2010 tells us that less than half of them have a church home. Plenty of work to do. In other words, we're not trying to multiply ourselves in like uh, Champaign or in Vernon Hills or in the North Shore or uh, Evanston. Right? We're, we, we have a neighborhood as a church. And we're thinking along a number of lines for where in that, co- in that box. We're thinking proximity to neighborhoods, families, and schools matters. We're thinking, why plant a, a, a campus right next to a gospel-centered church that's already there? That wouldn't make a whole lot of sense if we could avoid that. We're thinking, where in that region is, so if you think those two things, proximity to schools and, and neighborhoods, distance from an, an already established gospel-focused church, and where we might already have traction with some people that are attending here. So there's a number of places, regions that pop up, but we, we haven't said this is it. Add to that, it might also come from the heart of the leader. It might also well up from the heart of the person that God brings to lead that. So anyway, I, I don't have more to say about that than that. I'm not hiding anything. That's as far as we are on this. You know, um, That's a good question. Okay. Uh, others about, about that in fourth campus before we move on to something specific to this campus. I have a question. Yes. Okay. 
Okay. All right. I'll wait around for you. <laughs> next question, or next slide, sorry. Okay, I want to talk about the strategic future of this campus. I referenced this very briefly last meeting, but this is really important. Um, and some of this will be review for you uh, if you were here last meeting or watched it. Because of the proximity of the South Street campus to the Kesslinger campus, this is a unique situation. Nobody would strategically plant a campus a mile away. You wouldn't do that. Why would you do that? We didn't intend to do that. We intended to move out there, but we grew rapidly. And then what happened to us was we realized we need to keep both campuses open for a period of time. This is in the 2004 to 2007 years. We were large enough to need both campuses, but not large enough to build a massive thing out there. So you might remember we had plans back in those days to build the 1,500 square or seat auditorium with sloped floor fixed seating, but we were going to worship in a multi-purpose room as an, until we got there. And we're going to kind of keep both campuses open until we grew in strength and financial ability to do that. And then something called 2008 happened. You remember that year? When the market went in the tank and all things like that went on hold. We cut our budget by 10%. And by God's grace, we didn't lay anybody off like some churches did. We didn't, but we did feel it. And in that season, I think we realigned our thinking as a board and as a staff that maybe the best use of the financial resources is not to try to reproduce this square footage out there, not to build a big, giant campus at the Kesslinger property. We own this building. It's 45,000 square feet. I don't remember the number, but give or take. Um, and we could sell it for about $3 million, the, the estimates told us. It would cost us 9.5 to 10 to reproduce the square footage. Well, that doesn't make much sense. And we own it. And it's beautiful. So we've invested in it. And some of it you're standing in. We've renovated this room. We've renovated the lobby. We've renovated the downstairs area. We expanded Shepherd's Heart. On a number of different iterations, we've invested in the campus because we own it. And God's given it to us. And we're going to stay here. So that's been settled. But... Because it's so close to Kesslinger and we never intended, remember back in those days, some of you that were here, what's the best use of it? Now, for a long time, we wrestled with it. We couldn't get it to grow at the rate of Kesslinger. And we were frustrated about that. We tried the worship cafe down the hall, which became the launch team unintentionally for Mill Creek, right? We've added the word and table service, which is a beautiful service, but it's a small service. We changed the, the facilities and programming of children's down below. We've done a number of things to try to make it grow. And I think we're facing the, the reality, which is not a bad thing, it's a good thing. It's not, why are we doing that? Why are we trying to compete with Kesslinger? It's one church with a mile-long hallway, you know? That's a, that's, we're not going to draw people from there to come here. That's okay. So what is this campus? What should we use it for? Three things. Put that slide up. Vibrant traditional worship is not and will not go away. It's, <laughs> it's, I love it. It's part of who we are. We're not changing it. We're investing staffing and resources into it. Um, and, it and we want to do it with excellence, and we want it to be an attraction to our community. It's an increasingly rare thing in our culture. We want to market it and, and draw people to it, but it's staying right here. Uh, number two, central offices, or what you might call central services. We do have to be at office over at Kesslinger, but our central nerve system, if you've been here Monday through Friday, you know this is kind of where most people are, it's particularly those that we call central services, the departments that Abe leads, communications, facilities, uh, HR, and all of those things. The operation nerve center of all of Chapel Street is housed here and should be for the, for the future. And third, and this has been the thing that has kind of grown up and we're just now recognizing it, is the face of our compassion ministry to the community that which we call shepherd's heart. Far more than a food pantry, friends. Far, far more. Uh, it's, it wasn't that long ago that it was just a closet upstairs down the hall here, and if you came hungry, our, our staff, up, our, our, our administrative staff would go down the hall and get a cart and bring you a bag. Now we serve 1,100, 1,200 clients a month. That's just in the food pantry. We, uh, the budgeting teams and, and financial counseling teams meet with people three times, two different nights a week. Uh, we have, we've become a minister justice site, which is a remarkable ministry where people can get legal counsel and help that they can't afford. Uh, there's a whole lot to that to say. But it, it's a very robust ministry with lots of aspects to it, not just on the physical needs, but the spiritual needs as well. We're seeing God use it as a catalyst in people's lives to get them out of uh, 
generational poverty or, or systemic poverty, but also to bring them to faith in Christ. Some of them who have been transformed by it are now serving there. It's one of the most exciting things happening here on so many levels. And if we talk about being a neighborhood church, being good neighbors, this is one of the primary ways. It's so much more than a, 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 just a, another food pantry. If you've been here, you know the dignity with which people are treated here, the beauty of the space, the way they're cared for is just very special. Erin Wise and her team do an amazing job. We wrestle with, it's growing. We can't, it's not working downstairs here. The storage is too far away from the, the shopping. How many of you serve in Shepherd's Heart? You wheel those carts down the hallway, right? It's, it just doesn't work. Um, and the shopping space and the lobby space for our guests is too small. That whole, that whole on, on high traffic days, that whole um, hallway is clogged with clients. We gotta move. On top of that, there's no good access. We have some elderly people. Do you know that uh, about uh, five years ago, our primary clients were people that were uh, maybe racial minorities and living in Aurora and, and Elgin. Now we know who our, our top clients are. When I say clients, I mean people that come for help. Senior citizens living on government subsidies who can't afford. Um, so it's, it's a whole new, and, and those stairs are terrible for them right up here on the east side. We can't really fix that at the lower level. All that to say, we wrestle with, okay, what do we do? We've got to expand. We could go off-site. We could take Shepherd's Heart and, and buy a facility off-site. Our belief, and Aaron Wise is the head of this, is that the, the, when you do that, two bad things happen. You disconnect it from the life of our church. It's not, there's no interaction with our staff and people that are here throughout the week. And it becomes just another food pantry, of which there are, there are some. So we feel like it needs to stay connected to a campus, and this is the right campus because of its unique location. All that said, now you see the question we're facing, right? What do we do if we have to expand Shepherd's Heart because God's blessing it and growing it and there's fruitful ministry happening there, and we're not going to take it off site, and we got to get out of the basement. Let's see if we add this up. What, what is uh, we have to come upstairs. We believe that the right thing to do is to bring Shepherd's Heart to this level. And there are very few options. This room isn't going away. Traditional Bible and traditional worship is staying here. The student center, which we wrestled with, is a possibility. Its proximity to the kitchen, its size and multifaceted use would be a challenge to lose that for all of our ministries. So we think the right thing to do is to bring Shepherd's Heart up into the chapel. To make that which was once the original sanctuary on this campus become the place in which God is meeting physical and spiritual needs of people in our whole community. What a beautiful picture is that. I know the loss of the chapel makes some people nervous. We've got all kinds of plans uh, for how to re the student center will still be used for multi-purpose room. The, the kids station below can be re refitted so it's not, you're not sitting on kids' furniture. We, we, there will be a cost not just financial, but in terms of adjustments. But we really feel like it's worth it and the right thing to do. Now, no decisions have been made, no plans have been drawn, and uh, we're not breaking ground on this. I want, the reason we're having another church family meeting primarily is to tell you this. We intend to bring to you, to contract with Aspen, our design build firm, and work through plans and bring to you a proposed plan for what that would look like on this campus. It will not require us adding actual square footage. So there'll be no addition to the building. It will also not require us taking on debt. We would not do it if it required more debt. Um, so, but we intend to come back to you in, in like probably late January 2020 and say, okay, here's the plan we think is the right one. Because to do it, we're going to have to have a church vote. We're going to have to bring it to the congregation for a vote and approval. Um, I feel like I forgot to say something, but I'll just stop there because my head is spinning. Yours probably is too. Let me pause there. I'm, I know there will be questions. What, can we get these recorded on the mics, if there are? I'll try to answer them. Some I may say we don't know yet. We're working on that. Questions about that? James, Dr. Lee. Uh, Nancy's not here, but does the library go? Um, his question was, does the library go away? No. Um, the lobby space up here uh, could be multi-use during the week for our, our Shepherd's Heart guests, but we would not take away the library. That's a very good thing. I, I like books. <laughs> some it may involve some remodeling of some part of it, but we're going to keep that. The library will stay there. Yes. The way it is, <clears throat> the way it is right now with the food pantry, it's down there in the lower level, and people come and park at the lower level yes. and walk in that door. Right. If you put the pantry up where the church is, what are you going to do with the parking situation for people? 
This one I can answer. Okay. It's a, it's a great, great question. Do you hear, ever hear this question? What about parking? You, you, you might trade one problem for another, having to go down the stairs to having to walk around the building, right? So one of the potential uh, solutions to this, and we, again, no, no, no official plans drawn yet, is that if you, um, right out front there, that kind of the grassy knoll, which is not the best phrase to use, but the grassy area beyond the, the drive through um, to take that out, we could, uh, and, and to regrade all of that, that, that pass through, you could, we could get between 25 and 35 new parking spaces just out there alone, right at the entrance level, which would be great for our Shepherd's Heart clients and great for some of our seniors who attend worship and have to walk around as well. So there's a plan in place that would, it would, it would benefit all of the use of the facility okay. if we did that. Yeah, good question. A follow-up. It probably would be better for the handicapped parking too. Yes. But I mean, is it going to, would it be all handicap parking? No, so we'd have to have some little bit mobility, right. some handicap and some guest spaces. Because otherwise the food pantry couldn't change. park there. If it's, all, if it's all handicapped, the food pantry people right. coming in couldn't park there because you've got to right. have the sticker. and We'd have to designate certain spaces. And maybe some of the spaces during the week we'd have less handicapped than on yeah. Sunday morning. Yeah. We could change the signs. But all of this would have to be worked out in the plans with, uh, as, you know, over the next couple of months. Great question. Other questions? Make Abe run. <laughs> Hi, I have three questions. So um, my I'm first not. question is, if we're going to talk about parking lot, can we talk about Mill Creek? Any chance yes. that's on your agenda? Yeah. <laughs> do you want me to answer each one in, as we go, or do you want to sure. ask them all three? Sure, sure. Okay. That's the only Mill Creek one I have. It's a great question, Angie, and it is an issue over there, particularly at high times of the year. Um, that's a... By the way, you think, like, you do, I, I thought, hey, can't we just regrade that and put some gravel down? You can't do that because of codes, and, it, and it's really expensive to do a parking lot. It's a quarter of a million dollars to double that parking lot in size. We, we do have plans to do that. We are addressing that. I don't think we'll do that until this spring or summer okay. at the earliest. So questions number two and three go together. Um, as a person that comes to this campus for events with a daughter in a wheelchair that yeah. uses handicapped parking, <laughs> yes. um, I'm, I think it's great that you're looking at improving that situation um, even using the back entrance downstairs a couple weeks ago I almost knocked her wheelchair over because it needs uh, to be that, fixed that, that, that narrow, what uh, about if you're going to use more meeting space in the basement are you going to improve the elevator situation yeah. to go in there is very difficult and scary yes um, great question about the elevator um, I can't say definitively that we're going to address if you if I address it is it part of the plan it's all going to be cost issues, right? So we would love to put a full elevator in there because that would, like an like a, like a industrial size one, because we, we could have storage in the basement as well. We're going to have to look at the structural, what's around it, and the, and the cost of that. But yes, that would be something we are, is in, in the plans to address. Um, but I, I can't tell you definitively now that we're going to put a whole new elevator in. But it's on the list of many things that we have to address. The third question? No, that put it together. Okay, okay, good. The Thank you, Angie. Parking right. And the elevator. Thank you, Angie. Other questions? These are really good questions. And sometimes you ask things we have thought about, but I've been in many of these meetings where you, people ask things we haven't thought about, so please ask them if you have them. Where are the, thing, uh, the, the meetings that are taking place, like uh, the Knitting Guild and, and our Bible studies and all of that going to take place right. if you change that? If, if, if the chapel goes away and becomes Shepherd's Heart, where would those groups meet? Like, like seekers and, and, and knitting groups and a number of things. Well, the student center would not go away, so we certainly could meet in there, the, the room, right, right, which used to be the gym. That's still available. Also, at the lower level, what's now the kids' station has only kids' decorations and small furniture. We're thinking about renovating that to be a multi-purpose room throughout the week. That's still available. Um, so you're right. We'd have, we would have to address where do those other meetings go. Thank you. Yeah. Right next door. Did you have a question as well? No, I, she already asked me okay. <laughs> Great minds think alike. Um, Wednesday evening women's Bible study, we need to use both the student center and the chapel. Would you consider uh, a multi-use, I mean, for Shepherd's Heart and other usages, or will it be strictly restricted to just Shepherd's Heart? Good question. I think because of the nature of what Shepherd's Heart is, it doesn't lend itself to multi-use very easily because you have all the, the, the 
food and, and dry goods and storage there as well. So I don't, I don't know um, that that, it won't be a chapel anymore. It'll be Shepherd's Heart. But again, and I, I recognize this, that there's a loss to that. There's a cost to some of us to that. We're doing a cost-benefit analysis saying this is a remarkable ministry that's changing lives and it's, we think it's worth it. We'll find other ways to have those, we'll find other places to meet, but that, we think that is worth it. But you're, you're quite right. It will be inconvenient and, and challenging to find some spaces to meet. But uh, anyway, sorry, uh, Kelly. Yeah, thanks. Um, so for Word and Table, uh, which of course meets on, on Sunday mornings, uh, will that be impacted in any way or what? what? Yeah, uh, no, I don't, I don't think so. Well, in, impact in any way. Um, no, the Student Center will remain. Thank you. Where you meet right now will not, will not change. Um, under the, the current thinking, yeah. And Word and Table actually started in here. We started in here and, and just, and, and liked it in here. We moved into the student center, I think, one summer because we had to, and we just decided to keep it there because it was working. So I, I, we intend to keep having liturgical Word and Table service, not going away, but, um, so when you say, will it be impacted in any way? Yeah, I, again, that's further down the road than I can answer at this point. But I, don't, I, I can envision it staying right where it is because we wouldn't be taking the student center away. Yeah. That's it because that's such a valuable room with the proximity of the kitchen and the canteen and all the other areas. These are really good questions. I, I know for some of you you're going, oh no, what does this mean for this, for that, for that? But I hope over time you'll, you'll get a sense of the excitement. Clark had a question as well. Uh, uh, the excitement of what God's doing here um, because it really is pretty... For a long time, we wrestled with what, why, why do we have this campus a, a mile away? And I think the, those three things kind of answer it to me. Vibrant traditional worship, including to the liturgical worship, word and table. That it's the nerve center for our whole operation to expand the gospel in, their, in our neighborhood, right? And it's the face and center of our compassion ministry to the community. So, Clark. I'm just having a hard time visualizing that being big enough. So yeah. I hope we don't undersell ourselves on... What God has. I'm glad for you us. brought that up. Can I address that? Sure. So, because because some people on our board have pushed back just like that as well, saying, "Is that big enough?" We did a, a square footage study. Hey, do you want to speak to this? Since I'm my, my head, I'm talking too much. Sure. Yeah. Um, but no, uh, we we have inquired at least with with Aspen, who's been our partner through this, to at least get a sense of just from a footprint standpoint, no design as far as where actually everything goes, but what was kind of the trade-off uh, square footage by square footage. And, and it would be a, a, a rather significant increase. Um, actually, have, let me reference this so I don't miss yeah. speak to it here. But It'll, uh, it'll more than triple our, our shopping space right now. And it will double our storage space with nothing on, using nothing on the lower level. So, so currently, if you look at all the space we have dedicated to, to Shepherd's Heart, both in, in the, sh the store downstairs, the, sh uh, the storage we have, uh, we've got roughly 1,900 square feet, just a little bit over 1,900 square feet for, for Shepherd's Heart. If we look at what we would propose uh, by picking up the chapel and the area that's around that, uh, we'd be going to just over 5,700 square feet. So it'd be a rather dramatic over a 4,000 square foot increase. Now, do we believe that will meet our needs forever? Uh, we don't know. We, we hope that God continues to bless and, and you know, we run, you know, need to continue to look to expand down the road. Do we think that's a year or two? Probably not. We believe this will give us the space uh, for certainly as far as we can see out in the future right now uh, with the Shepherd's Heart expansion. Um, but if, if obviously we want to be faithful to and, and responsive to God's leading, if, if five, ten years down the road uh, we need more space, so then we'll, we'll certainly cross that bridge when we come to it. But we believe uh, based on those numbers, it give us, gives us a significant additional space that really allows us to meet those clients' needs. And I think, as Jeff alluded to, do it in a way that's, that's dignifying, but also provides them an opportunity to not just come to have a physical need met, but to provide the space needed to help address some of those other needs that ultimately you know, point them to Christ as well. So we gain space in, in our current lobby because we, that would be the place where guests are waiting to be greeted now. And that's way bigger than what they have downstairs now. Three quarters of the chapel becomes shopping. The back quarter of the chapel and what's now the bride's room becomes storage and loading dock. And there's a whole, I mean, again, I'm speaking a little bit out of turn because we haven't done all the plans and I'm sure there'll be many iterations of this. But it's a lot more space than, than you might think. Um, and, it would, and it's a, yes, Andy. Do you mind using the mic just so we get it captured so people, other people? 
I don't know enough about Shepherd's Heart. I'm really excited about this. I think this is yeah. fabulous. But I'm wondering, are we following a model that other churches use? Or are we growing this program organically as our own needs arise? That's a really good question and well-framed. A little bit of both, actually. So Erin Wise, who's not able to be here today, but on, on her team, had visited numerous care centers of other large churches in our area and even further out. But we're not copying, like, uh, cookie cutter, what other churches are doing. We're kind of, it's, it is organic in the sense that it's adapted for who we are and what, what the vision God has given us. Because the needs are endless. You could a clothing closet and food pantry, it could just grow exponentially and indefinitely. Um, and so, so yes and no, I guess is the answer to your question. One of the unique things that for Aaron is that um, different than your typical food pantries is, is the personal engagement with the clients. Anybody could come here off the street and get a bag of groceries. We don't refuse anybody. That's unique, by the way. Lots of churches don't do that. You have to be a member or, you know, on their list to get it. But if you want to become a Shepherd's Heart client, part of what we offer you need to come in and meet with a team. Bring your financials. They pray with you. They look at your situation. They sit down with you and set out a plan. And there's benevolent fund then could come into play, helping to pay down debt or get you pay mortgage or, or rent and utilities if you're in real trouble. But all that is because you, you avail yourself and say, I'm, I'm submitting to the process. And it's an amazing process. They do a great job of vetting and coming alongside people. But it's not just handouts of money, you know. Um, it's, a, it's a whole process by which... The food pantry is just the tip of the spear, really. Um, so some of that has been gleaned from other churches, but honestly, we've had other churches come to us and say, how are you doing that? Can we learn from you as well? So it's a little bit of both going on there. Any other staff members want to speak to that? I'm missing something. It's a really good question she asked. I'll add that Bruce. one of the joys that I get to hear from Aaron, like, thank you. <laughs> one of the joys that I get to experience is hearing Aaron talk about how Shepherd's Heart goes and influences our community. So she is invited by other parachurches, other churches, other community uh, gatherings to be taught how to do it the shepherd's heart way. Uh, and and it, it's touching and it's impacting because they're coming to us saying, y'all are doing something that we're not and you can teach us, would you? Yeah. And it, it's been happening with our Catholic churches our Catholic parachurches, and in multiple areas in our community. And, and again, those are the parts of the story that the average Joe doesn't really know about. But uh, it's something to celebrate that we are becoming uh, a resource to our community to do justice and to show compassion mm -hmm. better, uh, healthier, more like Jesus. Thanks, Bruce. Other questions? I would say the other thing is just that we don't want to reproduce. If there's something that's happening in the community that's being done well, we don't want to reproduce that. And so just Erin um, has a great network with other resources that she'll send mm -hmm. folks to as well. And so the idea is not to be all things to all people, but to, to yeah. fill needs where we see them happening. So if that puts you at ease at all. That's a good comment. That, that it's one of the things that Aaron and her team does do really well is not just reproduce everything, but point people to the right places that already exist to find help in areas that we don't have to, to reproduce. Thanks, Beth. Uh, Jeff, my question is, um, what's happening at Kesslinger Camp? As I understand that our, some of our growth out there, they're packing out that early service and- we uh, start turning people away. Yeah, <laughs> well, that's a problem. <laughs> Yeah. Maybe we're talking about that fourth camp. I don't know. Yeah, but I you. just could Good. you address what's happening out there so yeah. we kind of we see what's happening here, but the other places we don't know so right. much. That's right. Thanks. That's good. Thank you, Steve, for asking that question. First of all, if you just acknowledge, we should just pause and acknowledge and thank God that all the problems we're talking about are problems of growth. Space issues, where we're going to meet, how we're going to fit this in, how we're going to... These are all things because God is moving and blessing, and we thank him for that and want to hold that humbly and... And these are, these are different problems than how we're going to keep this thing going because people are not coming. Um, so I just, I, I recognize and need, we need to remind ourselves often that's not the result of any one person. That's the movement of God among us and we're grateful for that. Steve brings up a good, a good point. At Kesslinger, how many of you attend Kesslinger campus? How many of you attend 915 Kesslinger campus? What's going on at 915? It is crowded. It is crowded. So we set up 775 chairs on a Sunday morning. It could hold about 850, but we... But 
that's jammed in there for certain events, but 775. And if you have over 600 in there, it feels functionally full. What that means is if you come in a little bit late or right on time, you, there, it's hard to find a couple seats together. It looks and feels full, which surprises you because you think, well, there's 150 seats open. Yeah, but they're not that easy to find. And that means people that come in feel like it's not a place for them. We've been way over the 600 mark for 80% of this fall at 915. There's room at 1045. It's about maybe 100, 150 people less than the, than the 915 service. But we're trying to figure that out. One thing we're going to start doing, and started this week, is to start telling people, hey, if you can, come to 1045, it will help us. There's to make room for our guests. People do what they do, no matter how much you say things to them. So I'm not sure how much that will move the needle. That's one thing. Another thought is, what if we changed our worship times to 9 and 1030? You know 915 and 1045 are left over from when we used to have three services on this campus? 8, 915, 1045? We just always kept them there. Maybe we should go back to on the hour, on the half hour, and that might... People that don't want to go 1045, maybe 15 minutes would make a difference for them to come a little earlier. I don't know. Um, ultimately speaking, sending a group of 200 people off somewhere to plant the next campus is the big difference, but we're not ready for that yet. So we're exploring ways to help alleviate some of the space issues and overcrowding uh, now. But anyway, it's a good question. That's my best answer. <laughs> Glenn, and then Angie. One comment on what you just said at the uh, Kessinger campus. Last week, I was working as producer for the service yeah. up in the booth upstairs. Crazy. And I counted the empty chairs in the auditorium. Last week? Last week. There were 34. Yeah, there, well, that, last week we had 830 people attend the service. And with yeah. 34 empty chairs, just to get a perspective, that's wall to wall, one chair per row for the entire building. Yeah. Last week was exceptionally large. A part was time change, part of the baptisms were over there that hour, but yes. But I also have a question. Um, with the moving of the Shepherd's Heart, what's the plans for the space downstairs that they're in now? Where Shepherd's Heart is now? Yeah. Uh, there's a number of ideas on the table. None of them have been decided. One is to, is to move that wall out toward the hallway and make a, a, a medium-sized room for groups to meet in, a conference room, meeting room. One is to uh, subdivide it into office spaces because our administration office needs are growing, but we'll have to evaluate that with the needs and, the, and what the best use is. But we would repurpose it, yes. Angie. Um, I was wondering, with all of this growth, which is super exciting, we're not growing in volunteers in a lot of areas. There's a no. perpetual shortage in children's ministries, special needs ministries, I know sometimes no. ushers in other areas. How are we as a church making sure we're ready for all this growth that we have no. those places filled? That's a good question. Let's start with this room. Are all of you volunteering and serving somewhere? If not, get on the train. <laughs> right? We need you. Um, so it's, I, would not, I would take issue with one thing you said, the perpetual shortage of children. We, we, we did, for many years, it was kind of, the, you just could predict it, right? In the fall, we would talk about kids ministry and guilt was going to go in and serve in there. And then we, there were a number of years where we didn't have that where we had the volunteers. And now this year, we kind of back to like, oh, we have a lack a little bit. So we have seen growth in that area. I could tell you that the number of people serving and the number of new servants is up year over year for us. It just isn't keeping up with the amount of needs. So I, I take your point. I don't have a magic bullet for that other than talking about it, praying about it, preaching about it, and um, telling all of you to recruit your friends to come and serve because it's, it's worth giving your life to Okay, maybe if we talk to like three, the Bears will have one. We got one more. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just have a question on baptism. Yeah. I know you have the baptisms there over at the other church. Yes. Are they ever going to repair this uh, baptism here so it be be operational? Yes. Um, he's referring to this baptismal has not worked in over a decade. It leaks. Uh, we did a study of what it would cost. This is a long time ago when John Harper was still with us, and it was just cost prohibitive. It didn't seem to, to be wise. We thought we could put a portable one in the student center, but that floor, the infrastructure of the floor, Aspen tells us, would not support that weight. We were in danger of damaging the substructure, so, so we haven't done them on this campus. And I don't have an answer to that. We could revisit that again, uh, but I don't have a good answer to that for that right now. So. But I do want to do baptisms more frequently. Uh, and give people more opportunities to respond. So I think we do need to address this campus because we have people worshiping here and coming to Christ here. So that's kind of a non-answer to your very good question. Good question, I don't know. 
All right? So, again, let me reiterate. Uh, expect to hear from us, particularly if you're a member, uh, announcement of another meeting in 2020, early in the new year, when we'll talk more specifics about the plan, what it actually involves, and lay out a plan to call for a church vote to move on this. So the next meeting will not be the vote. It'll be the meeting before the vote. Does that make sense? <laughs> um, and some of you might be wondering about the finances of this. If we're not going to go into that, how will we pay for it? Um, we, we just, one thing to, just to celebrate and say thanks God, praise God for is we've had over a half a million dollars, well over, pledged toward this by individual people who care about Shepherd's Heart and care about this ministry and say, when you figure out a plan that's going to work, let us know we'll be part of it. So God is moving in that way as well. Um, but we would not take on it, we'd not do a campaign, we would not take on a massive amount of debt to do this. It would not, that we don't think that's wise right now. Okay. John, will you wrap us up in prayer? Thank you. Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, thank you that we get to be part of something that will never end, your church. We thank you that because of the work of Jesus that we are part of something that the gates of hell cannot prevail against. And as Jeff has mentioned, Father, may we be part of taking ground for your kingdom at this time. You've called us to do that at this time and in this place. So Father, do that work in us and through us for your glory, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.